Okay, now I want to talk about the hardest subject in the land for a pastor <laughs> to speak on. I actually want to talk about mamanos. I want to talk about treasures. I want to talk about possessions. Or maybe let me, if I translate it, I want to talk to you about money. Amen. Um, I, I feel as though I'm going to be a good presenter in this category. Uh, I don't have a, don't live a lavish life of anything, so I don't want you to feel like whatever you're doing is good. Whatever I'm talking about is for me to get capital gain. It's not about that. I'm going to talk to you about money so that God, so that you understand how God uses it to bless you. Right? Amen. And so you we're in our series, Giving and Receiving. And this is that lightning rod that everyone tries to stay away from because church is money and so pastors have gone out and done things that make you say, wow, why should I give to that church? And so I want to clear up some of those misnomers today. Mamanos, Strong's transliteration, 3126, it's riches, possession, or money. Your lesson, your lesson this morning, it is Giving is for the receiver. That's something that you have to understand. I'm going to read a scripture for you. It's in Acts 20th chapter, and it's in the uh, 35th verse. It says, in everything, this is Paul writing. He says, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of remember, remembering the words the Lord Jesus Himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I honestly believe that, and I know for the givers in this room, you know that the feeling that the, the blessings that come from giving outweigh what it is you will receive. I'm going to talk to you out of Malachi today. He lived somewhere between 500 B.C. and 460 B.C. He starts to write, he's going to write these four chapters, and he's speaking to the people about breaking covenants with the Lord. And so as we, get, we prepare our hearts to go into that, I want you to just kind of get your finger on that last chapter of the Old Testament. The outcome today is understanding that receiving allows you to give. So it is an endless cycle. When you receive something, it puts you in the position to give. And so that's why we want to continue this. Your quote of the day comes from Solomon. Proverbs 11.24. It says, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but, become, but comes to poverty. And so we, all, we know that this is not an anomaly with just the one or two people that you see. There's some people out there, you look at them all, and they, they give all the time, and they just see, it just seems like they always have to give. And then you see people... Uh, that, that don't give for whatever reason, and they're holding on and holding on, and it seems like they're always broke. They're always in need. I, I remember when I was young, they used to always tell me this. They said, if you uh, hold on to something so tight, you won't let it go, but you also won't let anything in. And so that was something that I learned early on in my life. And this is what Solomon is talking about. Your critical points this morning, I want you to see them the way they're written. I, first of all, I want you to understand the reasoning behind asking someone to give to a church entity. I'm using Malachi because he's talking about giving to the temple, which is the house of the Lord. And so the first thing I want to talk to you about reason, through understanding and why this is written, the motivation, the cause, the goal, and the purpose. And then the second thing I want to talk to you about is repercussions, not repercussions of not obeying God, but more or less repercussions in allowing the devil to oppress you. 
And then I want to talk to you about the rewards. We've heard the scripture, Malachi 3.10, over and over again, where he says he's going to open up these windows and pour out these blessings on us. And then the, la the last point will be the reality. And that is God's protection and understanding that when he blesses you with something, there's absolutely no sorrow. So would you go with me to Malachi 3.8? Now, his name means my messenger. Not a lot is known about this particular prophet. He's ministering to, uh, to the uh, southern portion, uh, southern parts of Judah during this day. And he has this job to do. He has to go tell them that they are not offering to the Lord correctly. In, the, in this day and time, the main offering would have been uh, livestock and agriculture. H however, there were still uh, uh, there were still financial offerings taking place, but it would have been livestock. And so, what he said to them, he said, "Listen, you were supposed to bring your best animals to the table for offering." But what we found out is that you were bringing lame animals. He talks about this in the first chapter of Malachi. He said you were bringing lame animals. You were bringing animals that were blemished. And so he makes a reference for un us to understand that what God is interested most when it comes to an offering is making sure that he gets the first fruit. That's the first thing you need to know. And so let me read Malachi 3.8. This is... Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? And then he says, in tithes and offering. I want to bring you to the first point of the day, the reason. It is the default of the first fruit is what is most uh, uh, de detestable when it comes to an offering that is not given through the heart. It's almost as if I said to you, um, well, I'll tell you what, um, I want to invite you to dinner. And everybody's like, "Where hey, we're going to go to Pastor John's house for dinner, you know. And then I say, guess what? I got some leftovers from last week. And, and they're going to be good, man. Ooh, I, got, I got leftover from last week, and they was good, and I'm going to give. And then you say, <clears throat> to me, you probably say, oh, okay, thank you. And then when you leave, you start using some of those words that I told you don't be using. Because, because it doesn't seem like I cared enough to offer you a first fruit. Okay? So that's the first thing you have to understand about tithing when it comes to giving to God. You're offering the first fruit. Now, there's a lot of practical things that come out of that. And so there are those of you that if, if you're in this room and you're a tither, there's something that you can, there's some things that you can still learn out of this. If you're in this room and you're not a tither, I'm not, I'm not going to get rid of you. You ain't going to get off that easy. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not watching what you give. I want you here. And I've seen many people leave the church because the pastor goes up and says, oh, you better tithe this, that, and the other. Oh, you ain't getting off that easy. If you don't tithe, I still want you here. Amen? So you're not getting off that easy. But I do want you to hear some things that will bless you today. And so here's what I want you to see. That when we start to talk about tithing, the first thing that you want to do is to find out how you can give the first fruit. There's some practical things that happen when you give the first fruit. You don't have any frivolous thing. You don't have any money left over for frivolous things, okay? So that's the first thing that happens when you're, well, if you're, you know, what I call a low-budget tither, like, like I am, the first thing I do to make sure that I don't spend God's money is I give God his money first, 
Okay, so I'm not a man of many, many means or anything like that. However, I do reap the blessings of what God is doing in my household through the love that I have in my friends, the position that he's blessed me with, my, my relationship with my wife, and so on and so on. But the first thing that I do is I make sure that I give it to the one who, in whom it belongs. So that's one of the things over the years that have made me what you might call a successful tither. Because when my money comes in, I immediately portion out God's money and I get it away from me. All right? I understand how important God's money is to the people that he wants it allocated to. All right? Because, of course, our God doesn't need money, right? Our God's up in heaven. He doesn't need money. But he has a plan to grow his entities here on earth. And those plans, those entities grow based on you and I saying, I want to financially support them. So I understand that. The second thing I want you to see is uh, one, of, one of the things that gets us behind. It, it's the default. The first thing was default of the first fruit. The second thing was insufficient giving. Insufficient giving is when you don't give in proportion to what you have. You know, the, the, when you start looking at the Old Testament, the Old Testament kind of gives you the number tithe. You know, they, it says one-tenth, okay? But you know that if you are able to do more, you should. And that's what I like about the New Testament. The New Testament doesn't let me off the hook from tithing. What it does, it allows me to give far more. And so many of us are saying, well, okay, I'm giving my 10% and I'm giving my 2% over here and I'm giving my this, that, and the other, but God has put you in the position to do far more. And so I need to minister to you today because I know you're probably saying, well, Pastor John, I don't really need that lesson. You know, I'm a big giver in this church and you probably are, but I want you to understand that God is looking at the heart. And so if you're able to do more than what you're doing, God is speaking to you. If you're in your seat and you say, hey, God, I just can't get there. I cannot financially manage 10% of my income to give to the temple or to the church. Then all you need to do is just talk to God and say, what can I give? You know, you're not going to get a bill in the mail from me. You know, wouldn't there be something I got on the phone, call you? Uh, this is the church of da da blah, blah, blah. You are late on your tithe. I mean, we don't, we don't do that. Everything's according to how you feel. The offering plate comes around. You have the opportunity to put in it, put out of it. There's nobody in this room that should be talking to you about what you're doing in that offering plate. That's all between you and God. You, some of you all play online. I know, so the offering plate comes around you don't put anything in it because you pay online. But what I'm saying to you is that God is ministering to you right now as to how to be a perfect giver because it blesses you. And so the last thing I want to talk to you, well, the last thing in this particular uh, point is failure to comply. So we had these three things. Default of the first fruit, that's one, uh, one thing that we, we, you know, we fall out of grace with when we don't do that. The other thing is insufficient giving. We don't give up to our potential. And then the other thing is just plain failure to comply. Why, do pe- why would a person say, I'm not going to give anything at all? Well, I think I have the answer to that. I think the answer to that is when you feel like what you're giving is not going to be used like it's supposed to be used. I think that's one primary reason that people don't give. Now, there are others, people will say, well, you know, I don't, they, they, you know, I'll give that money and the pastor's riding around, you know, he got a Bentley and 10,000 square foot home and, you know, custom made clothes. Well, let me just tell you something. You came to the right place this morning. I don't have any of that. <laughs> so what happens is we say, well, I'm not going to comply for this particular reason or that particular reason. Please do not put yourself in that position. When we used to go out, some of you all, when we used to go out to the nightclubs and we pay our money to get in clubs, nobody cared what the establishment did with it other than making sure that the music was right, the drinks was flowing and so on and so on for those that used to do that. You didn't say, oh, 
I don't want that person to get rich off of me. When you go out and buy a, a CD or, a, uh, you know, go online and, and, and buy music, download music and things like that, you don't have the, the uh, mentality to say, well, I'm not going to give it to him because I don't want that CEO to get rich. You, you, what you're after is a product and you're willing to help that entity be better at what they do with your money. So when you give to a gem, you, a, uh, a particular gem, you say, well, I'm not really concerned about whether that owner is going to make money or not. What I'm concerned about is that, it's, you know, the gym has all the equipment that I need and I can go there and work out. And so I don't want you to put yourself in a position where you're in one of these categories that you're defaulting on your first fruit, that you're insufficient in your giving, or you just, in, just refuse to comply. I want to read verse 9 to you, and then I want to make the point of repercussion. Verse 9, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. And so, I need to explain to you what that curse is, okay? Because most people look at a curse and say, well, I, God cursed me. God is not cursing you. Let me explain to you what that is, okay? So the first thing I said was the repercussion. You need to look at that, the aftermath or the outcome. But listen, I put this little note here. The curse is when you have embraced or are walking in an ungodly practice, thereby enduring the consequences of it. When you get involved in ungodly practices, that's when you're walking under a curse. So it's not like God is saying, okay, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. All of a sudden, I'm going to throw, you know, I'm going to do this to you. No, what God is saying is this, you've chosen another way. And that way brings on destruction. That's all he's saying here. He's not a superstitious God. He doesn't want to hurt you because you didn't give him money. What he's saying is that I understand how much this means to you. The people that have the, 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 the love to sacrifice or to separate themselves from this one thing, I understand where their heart is. That's all. And so, as, he, as Malachi writes in verse 9, he says, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. So, I need to explain to you that the household, the household in which you're dwelling, those of us that are acting as heads of household, whether you're married or, or single, we have to be the one to encourage the family to tithe. That's our job. They have to see us doing this. It, it, if you, some of you have been, you know, in different places, so you understand what it's like to make sure that certain commissions are paid first, okay? And so you have a thorough understanding of the fact that I need to be doing this because it's the right thing to do. And, the, and you, all the other reasons are out the window. I'm doing this because I need to do it. But the household has to be trained in that way. They have to be trained to say, I cannot pay this right here. I cannot buy this right here because it would interfere with, what I, with my giving. See, <clears throat> So I can remember many times in my household that we were able to purchase things, but we knew it would interfere with our giving. And so we decided not to do it. I'm not saying everybody in this room has to do that. But I just want you to know that I'm a good example of what I'm teaching. I'm not telling you to do something that I don't do. There have been many a times when my wife and I sat down and we say, yeah, you know, we can do this or we can do this or blank, 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 blank. And when we, you know, shake it all out and, you know, on, on paper and start looking at line items, we say, no, that would affect how we give. 
And I know that you all are givers too, so I'm not standing up here trying to make you feel like I'm the only person that does it. But this is something that if you're not doing it, you might have to rethink. Don't let anything get in the way of your giving. And so when he says, hey, you're under a curse, he's just saying that you've chosen another way. Now, go, drop down to verse 10, because this is the one that you hear us pastors read all the time. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, okay? In this particular place, I'll divide this for you, we are talking about the temple. Translation, in modern day, we're talking about the church, okay? So he says, bring the whole tithe. They're under the law at this time, and he's telling them, just like they are taxed, they have to bring in 10% of their gross earnings to the temple. Or in this case, it could have been livestock, corn, and so on and so on. So they're required to do that. Well, you might ask why. Glad you asked. God has to create a resource for his house. We don't get grants to run churches. Churches are run by you. It's your giving that empowers the church financially. It's not by happenstance. It's God's plan. What God has said to those of us, that, at least those of us that believe, what he's saying is this. Do you believe that I blessed you with your financial resources. And then most of us would say, God, we believe that you bless us. With. And then he would say, now return unto me 10% so I can keep my house going. It's that simple. That's all he's saying. He's saying, listen, if you believe that it actually comes to me, if you believe that it belongs to me, then I need you to return 10% to that particular entity who is working my mission, who cannot be successful without it. It's that simple. Now, it is not anyone's job in here. And I want you to know something. You have to understand this. There are very few times that any of us pastors will look at what you're giving. There, there, there's one time for sure that we will look at what you're giving. That's if you are becoming an employee of the church, okay? So we look and say, does that person, is, is that person representing what God would want them to do with their capital? Um, um, if for some reason, if for some reason we were looking to do church planting in a particular area. Let's say we were going to do church planting in Newburgh and we wanted to know how many people lived in Newburgh and do they tithe enough to support a structure there. There would be something like that, but it's not something that I actually care very much about because it would change your heart towards the person if that was your motive. If a pastor runs around we're looking to see who gives, he could, you know, he might not be as true with the person that's not giving and he might be overly agreeing to the people that, that do give. Because you can imagine that if, if there was a person in this congregation that was given $50,000 a week and then he let me know it and, you know, I was looking and stuff like that, you know, then maybe we would be talking about Bentleys and stuff, right? But, but we don't want to get involved in that. So you have to understand that it's a very good practice of ours. Well, we don't go do that. The things I'm talking to you about today is so you can be, I want you to be involved in it so you can be blessed. Because as I read on, you're going to see what God says. He says, he said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And then he says that there might be food in my house where I explain to you the reasoning why. But listen to this. I like the way the Old Testament, I don't have the Old Testament up, I'm sure. Uh, um, it says, test me in this. But in the Old Testament, he says, and prove me. He says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessings that there will not be enough room to store it. 
Do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe this verse? He says, you try me. That if you are a person that are, is willing to give to my mission, you try me and see if I won't open up everything I have to make sure that you're blessed. Well, here's what I like about God. Remember this. Um, when you sow something, you always reap far more than you sow. So if I was to plant an apple seed, I would get the tree, the branches, the leaves, and apples year after year after year. When you give to God, it's not necessarily money that you're going to get back. Why? Because we all know that money cannot buy good health. Well, to a certain extent, but I think we're on the same page. Money cannot fix our families when, when someone's out there and they're going through a hard time. They're, you know, getting, you know, maybe beat up or maybe they're, you know, they're running away from home or they're on drugs, alcohol, whatever this thing is. Money doesn't fix that. We're all trying to figure out ways to, oh, God, rescue my son, rescue my daughter, my mother, my father. Well, guess what? Money does not fix that. So, so it's important for us to want more from God than just money. None of us should be putting money in the offering just because we want God to give us money. When we put money into the offering, what we're saying is, God, we're being obedient to you. And then the word blesses you by God doing things like giving you peace of mind. I mean, think about it like this. If it, you, you're watching the heroin overdoses, I have a meeting at Department of um, uh, the health department tomorrow at two o'clock with, with uh, applying for a county grant for the heroin overdoses and so on and so on. So would you say to God, I'm going to put my money in the offering so that you can give me $1,000 back or God, I'm going to be obedient to you because I want my son and daughter to walk in sobriety. Which would be more important? Money would not, you would not care about money when God can bring you peace. And so I don't want you to limit God by giving something and expecting that, oh, I'm going to get rich. That's the lotto. That's gambling. But what God does is he gives us what we need. He, he goes on. He says, so he says, test me in this, said the Lord. He said, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out of uh, so much of a blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Hey, um, have you ever just been overjoyed? Have you ever just had an unspeakable joy? I mean, some mornings you wake up, and those of us, I'm just, those of us that are married, and you know, you w wake up, you look over at your wife, and you know, the children are safe, and the, you know, at least for that week, the job was going okay. And, and you wake up and you say, God, thank you, Jesus. And you're just overjoyed because you recognize what he's done for you. That, that's the peace and joy that God gives you. It's not always something, you know, that you can touch. You know, I was at, the, um, I was at a prison on Thursday. And I was talking to uh, a young man. He's been down for a very long time. He's getting ready to come home. And so we're doing reentry program. And, and he wanted to talk about the goodness of God. He had found peace. All of these years of battling, all of these years of addiction, all of these years of violence, he had found peace. I want you to understand that money cannot buy this. So don't shortchange God by putting something in the offering and asking him to just bless you with money. Why don't we let his word be true? I want to talk to you about a reward. Go with me to verse 11. This is what he says. I will prevent 
pests from devouring your crops. And the vines of your field will not drop their fruit before it is right, saith the Lord Almighty. Let me finish up. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful and said a delightful land, excuse me, a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. I want to talk to you about the reality. The reality is that God will protect you from the very things that you can't see. You know that person on the job that was trying to do something to you, trying to assassinate, assassinate your character? It won't work. That person that was trying to break in your house, but all of a sudden he got scared off for no reason at all. He's providing a protection for you that you cannot see. And so the reality is simple. That when you obey God, there is no one that can come against you and win. And this is what we have to look at. Your critical points this morning. The reason. You have to have a thorough understanding of why we're giving to God's mission. Point number two was repercussions. Do not allow the devil to oppress you. Critical point number four, understanding the reward, that God's blessings are enough. Do not try to tell him what to do after you've released the tithe and the offering. And then the last thing, the reality. The reality is he will not only protect you, that, but he will give you a mind and a method to stay away from things that will put you in a position where you cannot give. Many of us have purchased some very large purchases. We've made some decisions, some financial decisions that have thrown us right out of the, 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 the ways of being able to give the way we want to. At, at a time like that, it's up to you to talk to God and say, God, show me how to be an excellent giver, even in this position. Maybe I cannot do 10%. God, I'm in a position right now where I've bought so much stuff, I can't even do 3%. But God, please don't count me out. I'm ready to give up some of these frivolous things that I've been involved in. And I'm going to take that money, God, and I'm going to give it to you. You see, I wouldn't want any of you sitting out on the street because you were trying to give money to the church. But I would be open to taking your cigarette money. I would be open to taking the money that you use to gamble with to help run the church. I would be open to, if you're involved in pornography or you're buying women or, or men or whatever, yes, I would be open to taking that money from you so that God's house can be run properly. Let the Lord search your heart. Bow with me in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, there are people in this room, God, they know you, Father. They're givers. And they're looking for ways, God, to give even more. Speak to them, Father, about ways that they can do that. There are people in here, God, that have gone through some situations, Father, and they've received your benefits, Lord God. Father, speak to them about giving back. There are some, Father, who are non-compliant. 
They're non-compliant to your word, God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will just open up understanding to them. I pray, Father, that they will not be condemned, but that they will be informed. We thank you for this and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's some of you out here that have never given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to pray with you. Um, after the service, if you need prayer, JoLynn and Sister Payne, I think, are going to meet, and uh, Sister Lewis are going to meet you down in the prayer room. Remember that I'd like to get you all to sign off on the list so that I could pray with you. And... Um, If you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to repeat after me loud enough to hear your own voice. Those people in the room that know the Lord, they're going to repeat with you as a sign of support. But if you've never given your life to Christ, I want to invite you today to accept him. Repeat after me loud enough to hear your own voice. Everybody in the room will be doing it. And once you've done this, the prayer doesn't change you, but believing it does you will have accepted Christ Jesus. Bow with me and repeat loud enough to hear your own voice. Father, in the name of Jesus, please forgive me for my sins and my unrighteousness. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that he died and that he was raised for my sin. Please accept me, Lord, as I accept you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer with your mouth and you believe it in your heart, you are saved. If you'd like to know more about Christ Jesus, if you'd like to receive a free Bible, when they open up that door over there where that beautiful young lady is standing, I want you to go right out of that door down to our prayer room. Now let me dismiss you with the benediction. Would you please stand? And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to the only wise God, the only lover of man, God, the only Savior that we could possibly have, be dominion, power. God, we thank you this morning for this opportunity. I pray that as we leave this place, God, that we will hear your voice, Lord Jesus, that we will do exactly what you've called us to do as it relates to loving one another. Let this love extend out the doors and past the campus, Lord God. And even as we have a strong work week, God, doing what you call us to do, that people will see Christ in us. We thank you for safe travel when we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Let us all say amen. Hug somebody and I'll meet you in the prayer room.